Yeah, wave at everybody if you would. There's Jim Conca, uh, Paula, and, and Brian. Would you mind waving at everybody so they know who you guys are? Um, and then Carl, yes, you're, you're that's Carl's our technical wizard, and uh, he'll be controlling things. If you have a problem, please address your question uh, technically. <laughs> uh, please address your question to, to Carl. Um, and you, you left off Lila. Lila is an incredibly important member of our group. Lila, you get to wave. Lila, uh, uh, you mind waving to everybody? Say hi. And, and, and uh, is it Lila or Layla? It's Lila. Lila, okay. Well, thank you, Lila. And welcome, everybody. As I say, we'll... we'll um, take another three minutes or so to let everybody come in and um and then i'll do another another round of introductions for everybody that that has arrived and in the meantime get your cup of tea out and uh, get a comfortable chair and um be ready for a riveting presentation on i'll turn the, on some music if anyone's interested it'll be It'll be I, some I soft it, music while we wait. I thought Let's it might see. be nice to have uh, Paula or, or you or me talk about Seattle Friends of Fishing and what we do. Yeah, Lila, why don't you why don't you talk about that now while uh, <laughs> people are coming in? Well, Seattle Friends of Fishing has been around, I think, for six years. Um, I joined up a year, year and a half ago. Um, and uh, this is a grassroots group that is supportive of nuclear energy that arose out of uh, concern for climate change. And uh, Brian and Paula were instrumental in, in starting that. And maybe you want to say a word or two about that. But the mission of the group is to, uh, to educate, to bring speakers to the public, um, to dispel myths and disinformation about nuclear power. And uh, so we give, we put together uh, groups of people to speak, um, have made some good friends. Dr. Conka um, is one tonight and uh, to speak to the public about uh, different aspects of uh, nuclear energy. And I'll stop there. I don't know, Paula, if you want to say a little more. I'm thinking you did such a good job. There's not too much more to say. We're, we're we're always interested um, to hear from folks if you have thoughts of topics that you're really interested in. Let me just kind of give everybody a heads up to watch for our next event will be October 25th, Town Hall, which is an entity in um, kind of this downtown side of Capitol Hill, is known for putting on all kinds of events and they're gonna put on a panel of our speakers. We're very excited to talk about a number of issues around nuclear power. Jim will be talking a lot about what are the energy um, needs and, and goals in the state of Washington, what's going on in Washington. Um, we have a speaker from UW's uh, Jackson School of International Studies, Scott Montgomery, and he follows what's happening with nuclear in Europe and um, as well as globally. Nick Turan works for TerraPower, which is a startup that Bill Gates helped start, and they um, have been researching and building the advanced nuclear um, and, you know, reactors. And so he's up on all of that information. So it should be a really good panel. That's October 25th at Town Hall. We'll certainly put out publicity. And um, if people, um, if we don't have your email, if you haven't like joined our Seattle Friends of Fish and Meetup, or you're not on our email list and you're comfortable, put your email into the chat and I'll um, have it then to uh, keep track of you to send. I just, I do not send emails except for events. I don't have time. So you won't get a bunch of stuff. That's it for me. Oh, excellent, Paula. Thank you very much. Um, so it's about five after um, and I think we should get going. Um, I'm uh, Nathaniel Short. I go by Skip. Um, I'm the leader of the Snohomish um, Citizens Climate Lobby chapter, and um, it, uh, I'm, we're co-hosting this 
with um, uh, Seattle Friends of Fission. You just heard from uh, Paula, uh, Paula and Brian and Layla um, are, uh, and, and Carl um, are all uh, Seattle Friends of Fission um, uh, co-sponsors of this. Um, Carl is our technical wizard. And um, if you've got any technical problems, uh, uh, please um, uh, chat with Carl and I'm sure we'll be able to help you out. Um, our presenta presentation tonight is um, on um, uh, nuclear waste. I'll let uh, Jim introduce the full title and, and, um, and then the presentation. It's by Dr. Jim's, Jim Conca. And uh, Dr. Conca is a trustee of the Herbert M. Parker Foundation in the Tri-Cities, Washington area. He's worked on nuclear and energy issues for 40 years at NASA, WSU, NMSU, Los Alamos National Laboratory, PNNL, and LLNL. Uh, so just steeped in the lore. Um, Dr. Conca has been an advisor to the DOE, EPA, state and federal regulatory agencies and industry. And um, he was a science contributor to Forbes on energy and nuclear issues for, for a decade. Um, Dr. Conca obtained his PhD in geochemistry from Caltech in 85 and his uh, Master of Science in uh, planetary science in 1981 and a Bachelor of Science in geology and biochemistry from Brown University in 1979. So um, well qualified uh, to, to talk about the issues of nuclear waste. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad to welcome you, Dr. Conca, and I'll let you uh, uh, introduce and, and talk about uh, nuclear waste. Good, I'm gonna share my screen. And uh, yeah, I do wish Eric Clapton were here singing Layla. That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to kind of dive right into this, and this is it's a lot of technical stuff here. Don't worry about it. Um, but it's kind of it's not the stuff that you learn in high school. So we really have to go over a few things. Um, so again, if if anyone wants to visit the Forbes site, I I still have my 550 articles over the last 10 years um, up there, and all you have to do is Google Conca Forbes and whatever subject you know, wind turbines or hydro or nuclear or nuclear waste, whatever, and it'll I'll come up in the first page. So nuclear waste. There are four categories of nuclear, nuclear waste in the United States. It's a little different in Europe because they don't have much bomb waste and we have more bomb waste than we have commercial waste. And they're very, very different. They have nothing to do with each other. A very different way of making it um, that has nothing to do with each other. So the first category is spent nuclear fuel. And this, these are this, these are you know rods. So they're they're made of uranium oxide, and they're a solid metal, you know, a bundle of, of rods. Um, there's nothing liquid in there. There's nothing that can you know leak out like one one hears about the Hanford tanks. But that's that's the second category, which is tank waste, high level waste. Now high level waste by definition is bomb waste. Okay, there's no such thing as high level commercial waste. Not, no such thing. There's spent nuclear fuel, which is commercial, and then there's high level waste, which is bomb waste. Now there's another category of bomb waste called transuranic waste, true waste. It's kind of a weird thing. It's mainly plutonium and, and americium and uranium contaminated. So, and I'll talk about how we get those two. And then the fourth category is low level waste, which is mainly dirt and a bunch of other junk that's thrown in there. Some, some medical waste, some other waste, but by volume, it's mainly dirt. Um, and it's not very contaminated. It's not very hot at all. So, um, so you don't have to have deep geologic disposal. So the first three spent nuclear fuel from commercial reactors, high level waste and transuranic waste from bomb making activities, they, they require by law, deep geologic disposal. Now I have to do a short nuclear primer, sorry, but it's actually more fascinating than you, than you might think. Um, uranium-235, splits easily, fission. So then we're talking about fission, it's splitting a large uh, nucleus into two smaller pieces. Uh, 238 does not fission easily, okay? Now, if you look at uranium or natural uranium, it's only 0.7% 235, not enough to, 
to maintain a controlled or uncontrolled chain reaction. So you, you, you have to smelt this ore just like you smelt iron ore. You get something called yellow cake with U308, uh, but it's only 0.7% 235. You have to be about 4%, depending on, uh, on the reactor design, to produce fuel to run a, a commercial reactor. Um, and so it's still mainly 238. So only 4%, 235, just enough to keep the reaction going. And, and to create heat, to turn steam, turn a turbine and, and, and create electricity. It's still mostly 238, that's very important. Nuclear weapons are all 235, or all plutonium 239, and we'll get to that. So there's hardly any 238 left. It has to all fission at the same microsecond in order to get your, your blast. Now, why this works, is that a neutron comes in, splits uranium-235 into two unequal pieces called fission products. Three neutrons out in a bunch of energy. So three for one, three neutrons out for one end, such a deal. This is why this works, right? Now, if you're a bomb, you're all 235. So those neutrons generally see another 235 and it splits. And so now you're at nine and then you know, 27, 81, boom. So in a microsecond, you're 10 to the 20 splits, 10 to the 20 neutrons, and everything goes off in a microsecond. That's a bomb. Now, the actual blast, the power of a weapon, of a nuclear weapon or atomic weapon, is the, these two pieces are flying apart very fast. And if you have uh, 10 to the 20 of these fissioning at the same microsecond, you're going to create a lot of heat and, and uh and a lot of pressure, and that's your blast. And nothing to do with radioactivity. Radioactivity is not why a nuclear weapon works. A nuclear weapon works because of the blast. So if you think about what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 250,000 people died from the blast. Only 800 people died from the radiation. So that it gives you a perspective, even though everyone focuses on the radiation, nothing to do with radiation. It's simply a big, big bomb. Now, if you're a nuclear commercial reactor, uh, or, or even a, a weapons reactor, if you're a reactor, not a bomb, you, again, it's mainly 238 still, it's only a few percent, uh, 235. So those neutrons coming off the splitting 235 generally do not see another 235. They see a 238, which doesn't split. It captures that neutron, becomes uranium-239, and then quickly double beta decays into plutonium-39. 239. We call this breeding. You're breeding plutonium 239 from uranium 238. All right. You're not fissioning it. You're not doing anything else. You're breeding another element from the original one. Now, the reason this is important is because 239 plutonium splits even easier than 235 uranium. So after two years in a commercial reactor, um, you're, you're actually producing more power from the bread plutonium-239 than you are from the original 235, uranium. After six years, all these fission products build up to the point they start scarfing up all the neutrons and the thing fizzles out. It's not spent, it's not used up, it's simply as too much junk in it. Um, you've only used about 5% of, of the energy in the original fuel. Now you can take it out, you can recycle it. France does that, a few other countries do that. We don't, so we just set it aside, let it cool off and we're supposed to dispose of it. Although you can burn it in fast reactors like Bill Gates is, is designing over in Bellevue. So, um, but anyway, this is, this is commercial fuel. Now, if you're, it, so after six years, you're, you're basically got too much junk in there. So you take it out, you put it in a, in a pool of water, you wait five years till almost everything is decayed away. Okay, all the really hot stuff is gone in five years in a pool of water. Then you take it out, put it in dry cast storage. And then the only two that are really left of concern are strontium 90 and cesium 137 but we will get to that. Now, if you're a weapons reactor, you wanna wake a weapon. Now the thing that we wanted to do and that Russia does and that North Korea is doing is you want plutonium rather than uranium-235 because it splits easier and therefore you don't need as much and it's light, lighter by mass. You can put it on a missile easier. So if you wanna missileize your weapon, you want plutonium. So what you do in a weapons reactor, not a commercial reactor, weapons reactor, is you have to take this out after six months 
because there's a lot of other breeding reactions going on, side reactions. And so what happens after six months is you start breeding in neutron poisons, things that scarf up the neutrons and like plutonium-240 and plutonium-242. You can't separate those out. So you have to stop the reactor, take the fuel out after only six months. That's what we did out here at Hanford. Um, and then you separate the plutonium and, and, and uranium and, you, and you, you, you polish it and you, you make your bomb and you get all the other junk that comes out of it into the tanks. That's what's sitting in the Hanford tanks. So again, you cannot make a weapon from commercial spent fuel because it has too many neutron poisons bred into it over six years. So again, we know who's making weapons and who's not because we can see from satellite images what, you know, who is taking out their fuel uh, in only six months instead of six years. So does everyone get that? I should also mention now you have two types of waste. You have the fission products, which are the hot stuff. The fission products, the only thing that's really hot in, in nuclear waste. And the, the half-life of strontium and cesium is only 30 years. So rule of thumb is seven half years to, to background. So in 210 years, the fuel is not very hot. You can hold it in your hand, all right? This is very important. Uranium, plutonium, they're just not very hot. You can hold them in your hand, it wouldn't hurt you at all. I've done it. So it's not dangerous in that regard. You have to powder it and then breathe it in in order for it to have any, any real danger. So the Hanford tanks, we won't really talk about those right now, but that's what these are. It's from making the, it's from separating the plutonium to make your bomb from a weapons reactor, not a commercial reactor. <coughs> so when you, so again, I'm gonna kind of finish up the bomb stuff quick because it's important. Um, especially to everyone over on the west side. Um, so if you have a weapons reactor like we had out at Hanford, we had nine of them. And so you take after only six months, again, not a commercial reactor, can't leave it in more than six months. So you take those assemblies out of the reactor, you, you, you take off the cladding, which is the coating, and you dissolve it up in acid. And then you start separate, a series of separations. So you separate out the, the, the real junk, the 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 fission products like strontium and cesium and gadolinium and all sorts of this junk that you don't want in your bomb because it will not work. So you separate those out and those go into the high level waste tanks, single shell tanks that you all have heard of. Then when that's done, the, the remaining material is put through a series of polishing steps. Okay, and that goes into what we call the true waste. That's, that's that third category, transuranic waste. And so these are the ones, and generally the ones leaking at Hanford are the transuranic waste, not, not the high level waste. Now a weird thing has happened in the last 50 years. Since 1970, most of the cesium strontium has been removed, all right? And the others mostly through one or two decay lives. So now the tanks do not have high level waste in them. They only have transuranic and low level waste. There is no high level waste left at Hanford. Let me say that again. There is no high level waste left at Hanford. Nothing in these tanks exceeds one curie per liter. So we'll talk about that if we have time at the end, but that's incredibly important. So everyone that talks about high level waste at Hanford, there's not high level waste at Hanford. Now there's about out of 57 million gallons, you could maybe call 600,000 gallons high level waste if you really need to. Okay, if you really need some high level waste to vitrify and call it a win, we could we can scare up 600,000 gallons, but the 57 million gallons are no longer high level waste. Now, let's go back uh, almost to the day I was born, 1957. National Academy of Sciences did a very nice study about what to do with nuclear waste. Uh, the um, Atomic Energy Commission, the predecessor to DOE and NRC, um, they, they went, you know, we started making bombs, of course, in 43, um, and then we started the first commercial nuclear plant in 1957, a uh, shipping port. So AEC goes to the National Academy of Sciences and says, hey, listen, we're going to start making a bunch of this weird waste. What do we do with it? Um, and they did a very nice study. I swear it was a half hour around the coffee table because any geologist worth their weight in salt, no pun intended, knows that massive salt is the only rock type you should put this stuff in. 
it will isolate it for a billion years. It takes a billion years for water to move an inch in this rock. And the best rock is in Carlsbad, uh, is, is in southeastern New Mexico, West Texas. We know this. We have a deep geologic nuclear repository working there, which I will talk about that few people know about. Um, and the reason this is so good, besides being massive and impermeable, it cannot maintain an opening, a fracture, a pore space, a room, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> as soon as, as you put this stuff in, as soon as you cut out a room, in fact, uh, the walls, floor, ceiling, everything starts creeping in because of the overburden. If you're half a mile below the earth, the overburden will, will actually start to close everything up because the salt is semi-plastic under a great pressure. Um, not at the surface, but under a great pressure. Um, so this is the, it's tr nature's trash compactor. I, you know, it's kind of funny, but it's what it is. And it's very, very effective. So that was 1957. So we chose the salt as best. Then the AEC establishes these new categories for waste. And then, okay, we're going to do deep geologic disposal for them. Um, and low level waste put someplace else. The EPA was formed. We decided not to reprocess commercial fuel because of uh, proliferation concerns, which were not viable. There's no concern. You cannot make nuclear bombs out of nuclear waste from a commercial reactor. Like I mentioned, you breed in too many poisons. Um, so then we decided, okay, we're not going to reprocess. And then we might change our minds after we dispose of the spent nuclear fuel, we might want to get it back out. I mean, that's insane, but hey, you know, the, the greatest uh, scientist in Congress came up with that one. So the idea that you would not want to throw away something forever and ever, you're going to spend billions of dollars putting it a half mile below the earth in the perfectly tight uh, material, but then you might want to get it out. So we decided, well, you don't get it out of the salt because the salt closes re relatively quickly. So you don't want to keep it open. Um, so, okay. So everyone said, well, let's go find another rock, which was a dumb idea. It was a really terrible idea because this is the best rock. Now, unknown to most, transuranic, this category here, um, continue to go under the salt because no one even knows what transuranic is. <laughs> so never discussed. So it kind of went under the radar and it kept going. And we have a wonderful repository for transuranic waste that was built and designed for everything. And it's been operating for 22 years brilliantly. Now, then the Nuclear Waste Policy Act came into existence in 1982. And that kind of ruined everything. Now, and as, as I mentioned, all the high level waste at Hanford is only transuranic and low level now. So there's not much high level waste, waste left. Some of it in Savannah River, a few other places, but there's not much left. All, the biggest uh, source, or the biggest stockpile of high level waste was at Hanford, always has been. So 1982 comes around. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act called for two high level waste sites, two not just one, um, that could jettison later. Uh, there were 17 candidate sites, and the first was going to be in the west or the south, and the second was going to be in the north or the east. Um, and then in a few years after that, the idea of retrieving uh, spent nuclear fuel took hold, killing salt as the host rock, and by 1987, there were three candidate sites narrowed from the 17. You might recognize these. One was Yucca Mountain, Nevada. The other, another one was Hanford, Washington, right here. And then Deaf Smith County, Texas. Now, usually if I was in the room with everyone, I'd say, who was Speaker of the House in 1987? Ah, well, it was Jim Wright from Texas. <laughs> who was House Majority Leader? Ah, it was Tom Foley from Washington State. There was this new junior named Harry Reid. And they said, Harry, it's yours. Uh, he was from Nevada. So from that point, you couldn't get elected dog catcher in Vegas if you were for Yucca Mountain, okay, because it was seen as being shoved down their throats, which it was. Uh, it was a purely political decision. Well, as we talk about, Yucca Mountain is, is a lousy place to put anything. It was a terrible rock. I mean, you could do it if you spend enough money, but then you could make my backyard work. So Reed, of course, became Senate Majority Leader in 20. In 20 uh, 2006, 2008, the Yucca Mountain license application was submitted to NRC. I was one of the original authors, very proud of the work we did. Very, very proud. Great work, even though it was a lousy rock, but that's okay. Uh, 2009, um, 
Obama killed it because basically Reid said he want my help in the Senate. You're going to kill your mountain. I was very glad they killed it because it's a lousy rock. But, you know, the reason was very political, just like it was born politically. So people were saying, oh, my God, politics killed Yucca Mountain. No, no, politics bore Yucca Mountain. It started it and then it was killed by it. So it's the same old thing. The original scientific decision was salt, and that still is the best decision. So in 2009, uh, President Obama put together a Blue Ribbon Commission, and it was a brilliant commission. I loved it, worked with them, hosted them down at WIP. Uh, down at in in the salt uh, where we have the repository that I'll talk about, um, develop a new strategy, and of course everyone ignored it. So this is Yucca Mountain. Now I want to mention Yucca Mountain, the the Topopore Spring Tuff, which is a volcanic tuff, is a highly fractured, oxidizing, variably saturated, dual porosity hydrologic system that sits on the edge of the Las Vegas shear zone. Now, which of those terms makes you feel good? None of them, they're terrible. So as a result of that, we had to institute extreme re-engineering at great cost, an extra 200 billion, but you know, we're rich, in order to counteract the fact that we chose the wrong rock. So we had to come up with seven engineered barriers to make this even possibly work. Um, and I'm an engineer barrier guy, so you know, I, you know, great work, wonderful, but unnecessary if you choose the right rock. So if you choose the wrong rock, very difficult, very time consuming, very expensive. Uh, if you choose the right rock, it's easy, cheap, quick. So there is the right rock. And that, of course, unknown to most people, um, is in the salts in southeastern uh, New Mexico. And the, 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 uh, the repository is called WIP, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plan. It's been operating for 22 years. All right, here's the surface facility. Here are the, you know, the trucks that, that bring in different types of waste. This is the 72B cast. This is just what you would do for commercial spent fuel. This is how you transport it on the roads. We do it all the time. Now it was only permitted. It was designed and built for everything, but it was only permitted for transuranic waste. Okay. And that is the lowest, the lower cutoff is 100 nanocuries per gram. Not that that means anything to 23 curies per liter. Now 23 curie per liter, um, the Hanford tank waste, nothing, no tank is over one curie per liter. So we know how to handle this waste. We've been disposing of it for 22 years. It's a piece of cake. It is a piece of cake. I'm not kidding. Worked there for 10 years. Brilliant. It was very nice to work on a project that actually was working. Um, now, 16 square miles was set aside in 1992, the Land Withdrawal Act. When WIP is full, only a half to one square mile will be used. There's 16 of them. And of course, there's 10,000 square miles of this formation. So if you just want to, you know, legislate another little packet of land. But there's plenty of room in the 16 square miles for all the nuclear waste we could possibly produce in 500 years. Now, what's interesting is that WIP is ahead of schedule and under budget. Now, please tell me what federal program is ahead of schedule and under budget. No one, because this is the right rock. Yucca Mountain is 30 years behind schedule and $200 billion over budget because it's the wrong rock. Now here's WIP, the surface facilities. There are four shafts in, in, into the underground, air intake, air exhaust, salt handling, and waste handling. So these are, these are panels that are cut into the, the rock a half mile below the earth. Um, each panel has seven rooms, and each room is a football field in length and can hold 12,055 gallon drum equivalents of waste or whatever container will fit on the trucks and fit into this repository. Now, the reason this salt exists and why it's so good is there was a little Proto Pacific uh, arm that came into. Uh, East Washington, uh, sorry, Southeast New Mexico and West Texas from the Proto-Pacific Ocean during the Permian about 270 million years ago. And that, you know, for tectonic reasons, that arm kept getting shut off and evaporated, shut off, evaporated, flood, evaporated, flood, evaporated, flood, evaporated over 30 million years. And it precipitated 6,000 feet of salt, the top 2,000 of which is particularly pure and perfect for this application. Now, if, if I, we were together, I'd be handing out salt pieces of this salt. 
Um, and if you look closely, hold it up to a light, it's got little tiny square bubbles, crystallographically trapped 270 million year old seawater that as the basin was evaporating and the salt was precipitating, it would trap um, sea, uh, 270 million year old seawater in it. And we have looked at that and there's DNA, 270 million year old DNA, the oldest DNA we've ever found. Uh, cellulosics from, from cell walls and crenulated bacterial husks. It's nothing special, it's just halophilic bacteria, salt loving bacteria. But the reason that there's any organics left in it, organics don't last that long, um, is a testament to how isolated this rock is. There's no natural occurring radioactive materials like uranium that's in the walls right beside you or the floor or the air, radon. There's nothing down there except salt. And this is sodium chloride um, salt. I actually used to chop off pieces and, and uh, make margarita salt out of it. It was very funny. Um, and so it never was very deep enough to, to thermolytically destroy organics. So again, Nothing has happened in 270 million years to this rock, and nothing's going to happen for the next 200 million. And it takes water a billion years to move an inch in it. So there's nothing like this. We couldn't have manufactured a better rock. Now, in 2007, we actually started uh, shipping the high activity waste, the, the hot stuff, uh, to whip. Never had a problem. It's a piece of cake. Uh, here's we for the hot stuff, we robotically. Um, drill a hole in the wall. So, so this is, I'm sorry, this is one of those rooms in the panel I mentioned. Uh, it's pure salt, uh, pure sodium chloride, and you robotically drill out a 15 foot hole and you robotically push in your hot waste package and then seal it with a, a four foot metal uh, wrap cement plug. And so if you look, so, so if you look at the walls, here is the hot stuff in the walls with a four foot metal wrap cement plug. So if you look, so here is uh, uh, one of the waste rooms that's being filled. Um, I really, if you have a chance to go down there, it's actually brilliant. I used to lead trips when I was down there, congressmen and other people, and everyone loves it because it's so easy. It's so simple and it's working. So here's this person. This is a half mile below the earth. So there's not much cosmic rays get down there. Uh, no solar wind gets down there. Um, this is a pure salt, so there's no natural occurring radioactive materials like uranium in every soil. Ura you know, cesium, everything is in is in is in the sur is on the surface. That we're bathed in radiation about 600 milligram a year. Uh, right now, this person, uh, or when this was taken, was getting a tenth of the background radiation that you're getting sitting there watching this. Okay, because he's a half mile below the earth, and this is nuclear waste, but. You know, this is the, the plutonium and uranium and americium stuff that's only alpha, some beta, and it can't get through, you know, a quarter inch mile steel. So I mean, it's, it's easily shielded. And the really hot stuff is in the wall, robotically put there and plugged. So this guy, the only real dose he's getting is from the potato chips he ate that, that lunch. Um, and as you know, potato chips are the most radioactive food, right? You know that, right? It's no big deal, but it's kind of funny. So after 23 years of operation for this deep geologic repository that can handle everything, was designed and built for everything, and there's tons of room, uh, over 150,000 cubic meters of transuranic waste, more than all of the commercial waste combined, has been disposed of, the equivalent of 700,055 gallon drums, 22 storage sites, including Rocky Flats, is, is, is in WIP. Uh, there was one minor release. It didn't do anything. It didn't get anywhere. No one contaminated. Uh, that was in 2014, um, and it wasn't Whip's fault. Someone put someone from someplace else put the wrong stuff in the drum. It's okay. Whip worked perfectly the way it was supposed to work, and no one was contaminated. Now, what happens when you put the waste in here? And, and EPA requires we have at least one engineered barrier, so we chose magnesium oxide salt. It's great. It absorbs sodium, absorbs water, absorbs CO2. It's really neat. It's cheap. We don't need it, but okay, we had to have one. So when you fill these rooms, I mean, immediately, the wall floor ceiling starts, starts coming in. And so in 10 years, uh, you start you know, crushing this down. Um, and in a couple of hundred years, you're back to where the, the rock was in the beginning. And so I hate to throw complicated science here, but this is hydraulic conductivity and this is diffusion coefficient. Those are very low numbers. Okay, you couldn't, again, you couldn't, 
manufacture a rock this good. And that's because of the properties of the rock. And again, I don't want to get weird here, but it's just the ideal rock. Um, it's got very low porosity and all of that is a trap, you know, those, those crystallographically trapped bubbles and, and along grain boundaries. The pH is, is ideal uh, for, for holding radionuclides like, like, like plutonium immobile. Uh, you, you need to be acidic to, to really move the stuff. And the EH or the, the re reducing power, okay, uh, you know, no free oxygen, it's a free hydrogen, it's very reducing. And that uh, makes things like technetium and plutonium and neptunium not move at all, okay? So you want the EH to be really low, and this is the lowest EH uh, water in the country, so it's ideal. Uh, the thermal conductivity of salt is five times that of granite or tough, like, like at Yucca Mountain. And the annealing or this, this creep closure, this creep closure ability of the salt goes as the, at least the sixth power of the temperature, which means that it closes really quick the hotter you are. So the hotter the waste is, the better this rock works. Now, you again, you cannot manufacture something. You can't even imagine a rock this good. So you get, you're just handed with no effort, a performance period of 200 million years. And for Yucca Mountain, we had to work our butts off for 10,000 and or 100,000 years because with using all these engineered barriers and everything, because the water is dripping, it's oxidizing. Um, it's just not a good place to put this waste. Whereas this salt, you don't have to do anything. Just get it there. So you don't need engineered barriers. The waste forms are relevant. You don't need to vitrify. You don't need to do anything except meet the Department of Transportation requirements to get it on the road and get it there. So here's the 16 square miles set aside for WIP. Um, the final footprint, when it's done with its present mission, will be about a square mile out of 16. WIP is, again, 10 years ahead of schedule and a billion dollars under budget. Let's see. Now, if you increase, um, you know, put the Hanford tanks there and, and all the bomb waste from, from Savannah River and everything else, you know, you might increase the footprint by, um, you might double it to two square miles. So again, this can handle all the waste we could possibly generate because we're not generating any more bomb waste and bomb waste is the most voluminous nuclear waste there is. Uh, commercial waste is not even a, a third of it. Okay, let's get to the hand for tanks now. Now these, these again uh, are weird and, and it was formed in by that, uh, uh, process chart I, I showed. I want to throw this out because it's very, very important. Hanford tank waste poses no measurable risk to human health and the environment off-site. Off-site. There is no mechanism, geologic or otherwise, atmospheric, hydrologic, there's no way to get any of this waste off-site to any appreciable degree that it's going to hurt anyone, not even Richland, which is right next door. Okay, and we'll talk about that. Now that said, it poses only a small risk to workers on site, all right? So the people that are handling it, they're the ones that are taking the risk. The public has no risk to this. And the risk is greater if you vitrify the waste, which then leads you to wonder why we're vitrifying the waste. Now we're, we're vitrifying it because it was supposed to go to Yucca Mountain. Yucca Mountain will never open, but it was vitrified to go to Yucca Mountain where the waste form mattered. So again, back to this graph here, this, this cartoon. So the waste tanks you know, are filled with this mucky peanut butter-like junk with salt cake on it. I mean, it's really nasty stuff. And so you can't, you know, you, you can't transport that as is because Department of Transportation requires no free liquid. It has to be solid with no free liquid because the more liquid you have in it, the more possibility of actually something can leak. So it has to be solid. So again, this, the high-level waste tanks, which are no longer high-level waste, were the first two processing steps, and then the polishing steps went into the true tanks. And again, as I mentioned, most of the hot stuff is gone, so it's all true or low-level waste. Now, Hanford site's kind of bizarre. It's a very complex subsurface stratigraphy, you know, layers that are all weird, and this came from the Brett's floods during the, the, the last uh, glacial era. Um, so it's kind of mixed up. It's kind of weird. Some things are tight. Some things are very... Uh, un, not tight. So where these tanks are 
has, it has to come down, hit the water table, and then move um, towards the river. So all groundwater flow in this region is towards the Columbia River. Okay, it can't go in the other direction. It's all towards the Columbia River. So that's really where you're looking for you know, your modeling to tell you what's going to come out on the banks of the Columbia River and when. So the time frame that's, that we use, uh, 40 CFR 191, is that within a thousand years, there can't be more than four milliram per year whole body. Now, I don't want to, you know, four milliram per year, background is about 600 now. So four milligram is really tiny. So, but it can't, you know, regulatorily, it cannot exceed four, four milligram at the river's edge, no matter when, okay? Um, well, in the first thousand years, 10,000 year requirement is, is one in 10 chance of exceeding four milligram per year. Now we really concentrate on water because that's, that's the pathway that is most likely to get out. Um, you know, we aren't gonna be eating it. We're not gonna be, doing anything else, but it could contaminate water. So if you're looking at some futuristic family farm in the year 5,000 or something like that, then you want to know what's gonna to happen to the groundwater that's gonna be intercepted down gradient from this site, or will it get all the way to, to the, the water's edge? Now we're gonna spend a lot of time on this graph. Ah, not, I'm just kidding. Um, this is the kind of modeling you have to do. And you have to go back to all of these units and collect all of the samples in order to get the characteristics of each unit in order to plug into your advection, diffusion, dispersion uh, equations for how radionuclides are moving through the subsurface at the same time how they're decaying, all right? So it's kind of complicated, it's been 10 years uh, measure directly measuring properties in these rocks to put to, to plug into this. Uh, several other people were doing the same thing. We actually know this very well. Okay, this we know this much better than climate change modeling, which we are getting to know very well too. So again, our modeling capability is is quite good. The one thing the Yucca Mountain Project did was was uh, perfect our modeling. I mean, a lot of that money that was spent in Yucca Mountain wasn't wasted at all. It was you know went into computer modeling, it went into transportation studies, corrosion studies, all information that can be used no matter where we put this. So don't think of Yucca Mountain as being a waste of $12 billion. It wasn't. It was maybe a waste of $1 billion over 30 years. And, I mean, that's not even, you know, one bomber. So at the river's edge, the regulatory limit off, off the 300 area um, is 4 millirem per year. At the river's edge. Now, once it comes out at the river's edge, it it it, it enters the Columbia River and it's gone. You can't even measure it because it's so so diluted. But at the river's edge is where it cannot exceed four milligram per year. So we do the environmental impact statements, we do all that modeling, and we come up with scenarios. Okay, now I don't want to get into this because the number one scenario is no action. You just walk away from these tanks. You don't do anything. You just walk away from them. Maybe you, you know, fill them in with sand or put a record cap on them or something, but you don't treat them. You just walk away from these tanks. Let them leak into the ground and everything else. All these other alternatives are different types, whoops, different types of vitrification. So vitrification with you know, thermal supplemental treatment, vitrification with land closure, whatever, but it's all vitrification. We were not allowed to look at anything else like grouting which is much better, but that's okay. This is what we're supposed to look at. So if you look at the results, and you know, I, I don't wanna get into this too much, except that this is the core zone boundary. This is in the, two, the edge of the 200 area. This is the Columbia Re River near shore. This column is the radiation dose per year, millirem per year. Remember, background is 600. Um, the, hazard is, the hazard index is no big deal. It's, you know, closer to one, it's great. Um, and in the parentheses is the year. So in the year 4978, which is amusing because we don't, <laughs> the confidence in these numbers is one significant figure. So about 5,000, in the year about 5,000, um, the peak dose, if you do nothing, you walk away from these tanks, is 4.37 milligram per year, which is also funny. That's four, okay? We don't have the confidence in the third significant digit. So it's about four. But of course, it had to be a little over four if you act to, 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 to stimulate a regulatory action. Um, now, if you vitrify, all these others are different versions of vitrification. 
So you would then drop from four to one, because 0.9 is one, 0.8, 0.8, 0.8, whatever. All you're doing is dropping from four to one, because you, you can't clean up this bit, because that's already leaked out. Okay, so what these says is if you remove the source term, you remove the waste from the tank or you solidify it, doesn't matter if you solidify it in, in place or you take it out, vitrify it and, and bring it to some other state, you're removing further sources of leakage. And so what has already leaked out then dominates. All right, you got that? So what has already leaked out is leading to this one milliram a year. What's left could triple that, but tripling from one to four when the background is is 600, it's kind of bizarre. So in, in order to look at this, so again, the, the latest uh, update was 2013. It was updated from 1980. And we are, the background has gone up significantly, mainly because of, because of medical procedures. We do a lot of medical procedures. And if you pass someone who's had a, a medical procedure on, on the sidewalk, you will get a little dose, but again, not very much. So this is the background, and it's mainly from natural materials and then medical procedures. Everything else is, is almost nothing. So if you look at you know, the worst case, you just walk away from these tanks at the river's edge in the year 5,000, you're going to get an additional 4 millirem. It's like taking a flight from Seattle to New York and back. That gets you 4 millirem. Of course, worse, of course, if you move to Spokane, you're going to get 50 millirem. Now, should we outlaw that? Well, maybe. But no, this is absurd. So this is so far in the, in the noise of the background that, and this is the worst case, it's the worst case. Um, so, you know, if, if you actually take the, the you know, you, you vitrify it, you know, it's gonna cost you an extra $200 billion, but okay, you, you open your command, it's gonna cost you another $200 billion. Um, then you can drop it from 4 milliram to one for spending $400 billion. Now, Although DOE wasn't allowed to make this estimate, a lot of us have done enough work with grout, we can make this estimate. And so if you just grout the tanks, whether you grout them and, and send them to WIP or you grout them in place, doesn't matter, you're removing the source term, okay? And so that drops it from four to nine, point nine. So it's the same as vitrifying, except it's you know, almost 10 times cheaper. But that's okay. If you wanna do that, great. State doesn't like that idea, doesn't like grout. But the funny thing is that, you know, we've worked on grout. I, I came up with at least two, two formulations that work better than glass. Less leachability, uh, greater comp compressive strength. So it's like grout's great because this waste in the Hanford tanks chemically does not like to be in glass. That's why we're having so much problems doing this. It does not like to be in glass. It likes to be in grout. So we had a grout program in the 80s that was brilliant. Should have continued, but then, no, we're going to do glass. Okay, so glass, you know, it's going to cost about $160 billion over 60 years. It triples the volume of the waste. We generate a lot of secondary waste during, during the vitrification process. Most of this is low-level waste. So vitrifying low-level waste is insane. I mean, no one ever does that. Um, an additional 40,000 gallons of diesel per day, it'll double the carbon footprint of Hanford. If one cares about that, you might not. Now, grout, waste chemistry, very compatible uh, with this grout. Uh, no technical hurdles. We've been doing this. We know how to do it. Well-known process. It will only cost $50 billion over 30 years. Modest increase in volume of waste, but not you know, tripling it like that. Like uh, Grouting is a standard method for transuranic waste. So this is a standard method. We already know how to do this. No additional fuel needed, little effect on Hanford's carbon footprint. So, I mean, if you were to just, you know, as a scientist, just choose which one of these you would do, of course you'd use, choose grout, but scientists did not make this decision. Now for commercial spent fuel, um, interim storage is great. It's good for about 120 years. And if, if you need to move it to another dry cast storage, that's easy to do. So. Uh, you know, hopefully we're going to burn this fuel in fast reactors like Bill Gates is designing. Brilliant. You get 10 times the amount of energy for the same amount of waste. That's, that's what you want to do. And then that waste is very short lived. It's all fission products. And then you can put that wherever you want to put that. Now you probably heard about borehole disposal lately. It's, it's kind of become a big thing. If you, and, and we can drill boreholes to five kilometers, that's, that's not really a, a difficult thing. The only difficult thing is how wide do you want your, your drill hole, your drill bit? 
So if you're, you know, grouting something, you can make it as thin as you want, and you can make it thin and long, and you can put it down a borehole really well. If you get down to four or five kilometers, there is no geologic process that can get it back up. None. It has to go through plate tectonics, go back in the mantle, be recycled, and then come back up at ocean ridges. There's no way you can get this up to the surface. There is absolutely no process or method. So this is easy. It's simple. Uh, you can do a bunch of boreholes all around the country. Whoever has nuclear waste, you can do their own borehole. That kind of scares people because they, they were told it would go someplace else. But, you know, this is a very nice, nice thing to do, especially when you burn when you burn the present commercial fuel in fast reactors, again, like Bill Gates is doing, um, then you can make the size of your, your disposal packet or whatever to go down the borehole as thin as you want. And it's easy if you use a thin borehole than if you use a very wide borehole. So we can do this. Again, uh, we do it all the time in fracking. And, you know, we, we know how to drill holes. We know how to drill holes sideways, diagonally. We can do this very easily. Um, so what we're left with is this. This is the probable outcomes for the United States and nuclear waste. This is it. There's no other alternatives. I, I, I hate to say this, but this is it. So defense waste, which is all true in, in high-level waste, um, if you redefine it as true like, like it is or as low-level waste like it is, we, you, we can put that to WIP. Of course, that's a political decision because then you'd have to expand WIP's permit and the state would have to buy into that and all this, you know, you know, political nonsense because everyone's so scared of it, not knowing why. Um, high level waste we define as low level waste, which is most of this 57 million gallons. Uh, we actually have a place for that. <laughs> it's in Texas. Uh, it's called waste control specialists. They do this all the time. They expect they accept low level waste and bury it there. Or we could build a second salt repository like WIP, but that's kind of foolish. We already have one. We only need one. There's not enough waste to justify two or three or four. Um, and that's, you know, that's fine. So either we do that or everything stays right where it is. I mean, this is, this is what's going to happen, unfortunately. If I had to put money on it, I'll be long dead. But if I had to put money on it, everything's going to stay right where it is because we can't seem to make a national decision anymore as a country. We have, we're, a bun, you know, we're like you know, 50 children arguing. So we can't make a national decision. And nuclear is a national thing. Okay, there's no constituency for nuclear like there's, you know, Texas for oil or Pennsylvania for, for coal or, or for natural gas or West Virginia for coal. There's no, there's no state that, that identifies with, with nuclear, okay, because it's a nas national thing. It always was a national thing. So, again, if it stays right where it is, it stays right where it is. Commercial nuclear fuel, again, interim storage, burn in fast reactors like, like Gates is building. And then that waste, which is only fission products now all short-lived, um, then that could go into either, you know, just wait till it cools down. It's cool in 200 years. Um, or again, into WIP, if WIP were expanded, like it originally was decided by the National Academy of Sciences, this is where everything should go. All nuclear waste should go into this salt. But again, if we can't come up with that, then it's going to stay right where it is. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> well, we had a number of chat questions, I think, uh, Jim. Let me look at okay. those and, um, and uh, see what uh, we've got. Um, uh, one question, I'll go um, start from the back real quick and then go, go back up. Um, what's the millirem per year limit for fish and other aquatic organisms? Uh, it's the same. Okay, they, there there are food limits that are. Let's see. In in the U.S., um, it's on the order of seven thousand baccarels per kilogram of of fish flesh. <laughs> I would have to con convert that, but the you know the dominant one is this four milligram per year in terms of water. Okay, and water is very very important because that's where things live and that's what we drink and all that kind of thing. So uh, it never gets, gets high in fish or anything like that, it, unless you have something that concentrates up the food chain like lead or mercury, but we don't see that with the uh, radioactive materials. I don't know if that answers it, but, uh, but that, that's an easy Google question, actually. 
Yeah, yeah. It, you know. And if the source is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that's that's the best source for that info. Most, I apologize for not knowing that off the top of my head. I think most of these questions uh, could potentially be Googled. The um, the real benefit is um, having a, an expert like yourself. Yes, or, yes, uh, indeed. I'm, I'm sorry. I meant, tell me, tell me. I mean, give me them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then... Um, uh, I, th I think you addressed this, but I'll go ahead and ask it so you can reinforce it. But um, what's your opinion of the Hanford tank storage eventually leaking into the Columbia River? Right. So, so I, I, show, I showed you that modeling that says if you do nothing, if you just walk away from this, you're only going to get four milliram per year. Okay. Now, background is 600. So four milliram a year is going to do absolutely nothing. There's no danger from this waste to the river, to the to people, to the environment. The only risk is to the workers on site who are handling it. Right, good, good. Um, and that, that was the second part of it, should we be alarmed? Um, this one question is about um, the, the uh, Bill Gates reactor. I think that's the traveling wave. The, the, um... oh, okay, no, actually they, they've dropped the traveling wave. They have a molten salt fast reactor. No, this is not a conventional reactor going into Wyoming. This is a molten salt fast reactor that can burn traditional waste. All right. Yeah. And, yes. and, and now, now I, I should I should back up a little bit. We have built that reactor. We we had you know FFTF up here out of Hanford in, in the 80s and 90s. We built a fast reactor. In fact, all of the new designs that are coming up, pebble bed reactors, molten salt reactors, fast reactors, we built them all as experimental reactors and they worked. We know they work. We just have never commercialized it. So when right. you commercialize it, that's a big step because you know, someone has to make money, right? It has to be commercially viable. And so that's all that everyone's trying to do is build a reactor that is commercially viable. We know it works. And, right. and if, you, if you mind, uh, when, when I spoke with Mark Werner over there at TerraPower, uh, they indicated that the first few iterations of fuel would be conventional Halu fuel, not waste burning, but that is where they're headed. So it is like right. multiple iterations and we will get there someday. Right. And, and I should mention Halo like, like was, is, is highly you know, higher in high activity, low enriched uranium. So it's not, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, most reactors take four or 5%, you know, 235, but in, you know, Halo reactors take up to 20% uh, uranium-235, that gives you much higher power, much higher neutron flux, and that's what it takes to initiate uh, fast reacting, fast reactors, because you need a lot of neutrons that then just blow out everything, burns, you know, americium, burns neptunium, burns everything, um, and that's what a fast reactor does. And uh, so Nick Turan, who who is part of uh, this, well, he's he's in the, the parent company of TerraPower, he, he says, Technically, it is a sodium metal cooled reactor that uses non nuclear molten salt thermal energy. So <laughs> there is straight from the horse's mouth. It, it's it's a sodium cooled fast reactor. I uh, threw up the the uh, the selfie because someone said they didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great, uh, Jim. Thank you. Um, uh, so um, yeah, that. Uh, uh, the I, the question from uh, Michael Ruby is um, uh, how soon I guess uh, do you think that we'll be able to burn um, uh, the waste um, in uh, uh, the, our nuclear power plants using fast reactions? Well, Gates's Terra Power is looking at twenty thirty five. Is that right, Carl? About twenty thirty five. But so, we should not wait that long. I mean, the yeah, others are going to pick them up first. Uh, so as part of the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, I believe it needs to be done by 2029. Uh, oh, okay. for, that's, that's for the Natrium Project in Wyoming. Uh, okay. Ma good. Maybe I'm slightly off, maybe 2030, but th this is the same, you know, tw between 2027 and 2029 is the timeline for things to get either really interesting or slightly disappointing. Right, right. So by 2030, we should have proof of concept um, with um, uh, power being produced um, with waste fuel. Right. Now, proof of concept, this is we've, being... we've already done. We've already done yeah. proof of concept. Yeah, okay. it's, sure. it's also done in other parts right. of the world, isn't it? Yeah, oh yeah. Um, uh, yeah. China just fired up their first commercial fast reactor. <laughs> so they're doing it. Okay, so again, the concept is already old and done. 
all that we need to do is commercialize it, right? Because a right. lot of times, you know, going from the laboratory or from, from experimental stuff to the commercialization, there, there's, there's a hurdle there to make it cost effective. Now, China has already made it cost effective because you know, they can build their reactors half the price and half the time that we build it because they don't use subcontractors and everyone that, you know, walks off the job, they get to get new people, they have to retrain them. I mean, the way we do things in this country is not advantageous towards moving forward on climate change like we need to do. We tend to, you know, run around and dance around and do stupid things instead of what we need to do. Yeah, uh, I, I thought INEL um, uh, uh, had a fast reactor that actually powered ARCO, um, the city, uh, for the first time in the 50s. Yes. So, so again, most of these designs come from the 50s. In fact, uh, Edward Teller came up with the traveling wave reactor. Uh, concept. So again, we, you know, 50s and 60s, we actually did a bunch of things. They didn't get commercialized. We chose the light water reactor uh, that, that we have now, which is great. I mean, you know, we don't need new reactors. They're just better and, and more efficient and, you know, produce more energy. That's and the waste is easier to deal with. So that's okay. But what we have now is incredibly safe and effective. I mean, people, no one ever dies in the, in, in, in the nuclear industry, as opposed to every other industry. So, you know, it's kind of hard. Everyone says, oh, as long as it's safer. It's like, how safe is zero deaths? I mean, how, how, how much more <laughs> safe can you be not killing anyone? So oh. it's kind of kind of bizarre. Now, I should mention that uh, there's been no reactor that, that Nuclear Regulatory Commission has approved that has ever melted down. Right. Three Mile Island was before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission came into being. It, it didn't melt right. down, actually. Yeah, I mean, it's a partial meltdown. It was it was no big deal. Everyone freaked out, of course, but but yeah. So, but I wanted you know, the only accident we've had was in a pre-NRC world, and right. of course, you know, Chernobyl, Fukushima. We told them they, those are stupid reactors and they they shouldn't do them. But hey, you know, the Fukushima thing, we've been telling them for years that their seawall was crap and their backup generation was crap. But you know, hubris and greed, bad combo in, in anything. No. But. Um, but still, no one died from radiation at Fukushima. Yeah. Well, even with Three Mile Island and before NRC had their muscle, the containment vessel worked as designed. Yeah. Um, it's kind of on that same line, are the reactors that have been in use by the Navy for, what, 50 years, um, are they a different kind of technology than our typical large power water, pressure water reactors. Well, they yeah. did the same. The I was same, on one of those. Yes, yes. They, they used more enriched fuel so that they don't have to refuel as much. Because the higher, yeah, the higher amount of uranium-235, the less you have to refuel. Right. And so, so, so if you want a nuclear sub to go for years and years without ever refueling, then you use high, you know, more highly enriched uranium. But it's the same reactor design. It's a small modular reactor. Uh, in fact, they're the first small modular reactors, um, right. but they're they're you know traditional uh, pressurized water reactors. Yeah, pressurized water reactor, ninety eight percent enriched, um, and uh, yeah, very effective. Um, just like in the salt mines, when we were down on the sub, we got less radiation than uh, people walking around on the surface. Right. Never had an accident. Um, very safe. Never had a spill. Never had anything like a meltdown. Um, yeah. So we know how to do it. So I have, I want to go back to a general question that Catherine asked. And she said, I'm just curious in terms of nuclear power policy right now, which country on the planet is the most enlightened? I've heard France has done the best so far. France has done great, but China is the one leading the way. China has, is breaking ground on a new nuclear reactor every month and they are building it. They, you know, they have a five-year plan to have 180 Big nukes, not small modules, although they're, they're building small modules too, but 180 big nukes by, nukes by 2035. That will dwarf us, all right? And they need it. Now, they're also building coal and they're also building gas. They're also building hydro because they need to bring an additional 600 million people up out of abject poverty into the middle class. And they don't care how to do it. They're just building everything. They're building more renewables than everyone in the world. They're building more nuclear than everyone in the world, more coal than everyone in the world, because they need energy. There's, there's always been this dynamic tension between humans and the environment. 
Now, when there was only 10 million humans on the planet, which was the last you know, 200,000 years before about BC, um, that wasn't a big deal. Okay, but then the Industrial Revolution came along, and here we, we're now at 8 billion, almost 8 billion people, and you need to power them because it takes about 3,000 kilowatt hours per year per person to have what we consider a good life. All right, so the only way to say no, keep people in poverty, we care about global warming, not going to work. OK, and it's also kind of nasty because when you get 3000 kilowatt hours per person per year, the birth rate plummets. It's a very nice side effect because when you have enough energy, you begin to feel that you will live to age 40 and that your children will live to age 40. And that opens up a huge philosophical change in the society in which it's occurring. And we've seen that in every single society that has become, quote, developed. And that just means you have a lot of energy. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Michael Ruby asks um, uh, if um, burning waste fuel would change the economics uh, since you'd be paid uh, to take the fuel instead of paying for uh, storing it. Yes. And, and of course, if you get 10 times the amount of energy out of the same fuel right there, you know, your, your economics are wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And, and then um, uh, Jim Bloss asks, um, do we know who in Congress or elsewhere in government is supportive of using nuclear for energy generating purposes? Um, we'll start with that. Um, good question. Uh, Congress, there's a, a handful of congressmen that like it, but generally, if you're democratic, the base doesn't like it for ideological ring reasons, although they don't actually understand it, but they just don't like it. Okay. They've been told not to like it. Republicans care about fossil fuels. We're fuel. working on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we're we working are. on that. But, but again, like, like I mentioned, there's never been a constituency. There's never been a, a congressional delegation that has been wedded to nuclear because it's not a state specific thing. So it's just, you know, individuals who like it or don't like it, uh, mainly the southern uh, states are more pro-nuclear, just like us. They, they are regulated. They're in regulated electricity markets. Unregulated electricity markets are bad. Okay, I'll just state that right out. Bad. Uh, the cost of electricity is double or more. Um, and they tend to not like nuclear because they can't manipulate the power that comes out of a nuclear power plant, because it just produces power all the time. 95% of the time, nuclear is producing power. Um, so you can't, you know, mess with it easily. All right. So if you're, you know, if you're peaking, if you're saying, oh, okay, you're going to charge twice as much uh, for a, a kilowatt of electricity between the hours of three and seven at, you know, PM. Um, and so, okay, we're just, you know, we're just going to charge you this and we're going to fire up a bunch of gas plants or we're going to, shut down a bunch of wind turbines. So an unregulated market is adept at um, ripping us off. Sorry, that's about, about the best way to say it. Uh, regulated markets like we have, you can't. So the nuclear power plant out here, you know, Columbia Jardine Station right next to me, um, they, they're not for profit and they are only allowed to sell electricity at cost. They can't gouge you. Now, in Texas during the blackout last year, um, ERCOT, you know, the, the, the transmission operator down there, they gouged everyone. I mean, they, they charged people because they caused the blackout, okay? But they charged people, the consumer, a thousand bucks extra for that summer. Now, that is wrong. I, I'm sorry. You know, we've been telling ERCOT, you know, that you're stupid and what are you doing? You know, because they purposely didn't hook up to the rest of the country so they could get around FERC regulations, federal energy uh, regulatory commission. So they didn't hook up to the rest of the country. They stayed within the state of Texas. So they didn't have to follow regulations. Now that is supremely greedy and, and, and kind of dumb because when you don't follow regulations, bad things happen. I I'm a regulatory hound. I love regulations. They're great. Okay. That's how you wrangle corporations. It's not a corporation's job to save the world. Corporations jobs to make money. Okay, I get that. It's America. So we got to make a buck. I get it. But regulations are what keep that to a minimum um, sometimes <laughs> if Very you good. follow the regs. But if you get around the regs by some cute thing like Texas has done, then, you know, all bets are off and the consumers 
the people of Texas are going to suffer because of that. So, so a follow on also, Jim, thank you for that. Um, is um, how long do you believe it's going to take? This is again from Jim Bloss uh, to change the public's belief in uh, and support of nuclear power. I hate to say this. I really hate to say this. Um, it's being recorded, so I can't take it back. <laughs> enough, peop enough people have to die. I really hate to say that, but that's how humans work. Enough people have to die or go bankrupt um, or have you know, rolling blackouts where you know, during a heat wave and people die during heat waves when there's, when there's rolling blackouts. Um, I mean, Texas, there was a coal spell and it, about 170 people died from that blackout. Um, and it caused $3 billion in damage. So we have to have that happen a few times before people say, hey, wait a second, you're supposed to be running this. You're supposed to be giving us reliable power. What's going on? And so at that point, you say, well, we shut down you know, so many coal plants that we don't have anything to replace it because wind cannot replace it. And now you know, the, the, uh, the 2019 CETA le legislation out of Olympia uh, restricts gas. So you can't do coal, can't do gas. What are we doing? All right. Well, you should be doing nuclear and wind and solar and hydro, all the non-fossil fuels. But what we're doing is wind, which has no backup. So it doesn't deliver when it's really hot or really cold. So we are we are headed for some very bad blackouts post 2025. And it's not just closing our coal plant in, in Centralia, which is a big one. Um, all the surrounding states that we used to buy excess energy from their coal plants, they're closing their coal plants. So, so what do you do? You know, go to BC? I, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is insane. We have not planned it. Because the 2019 legislation occurred, we were planning to replace coal with natural gas. And then the 2019 legislation derailed that. So we have no plan to replace the coal power. And that is dangerous. That this, uh, you know, all, all the public utility district commissioners are scared. I'm not, not just worried. They are scared because there is no plan in place to replace coal with anything except wind and wind doesn't do it. I mean, you, you need a reliable source. Now you can do it, you know, you can have, nu again, nuclear, hydro, wind, and solar is a great combo. I've actually written about the combo that works. You want a Green New Deal that works, you gotta use all of them, okay? We can't, we don't have the luxury to pick and choose. We don't like wind or we don't like nuclear or whatever. You, you, you don't have that luxury, okay? You're trying to replace fossil fuel, which is 80% of our energy in this country, 80%. And you're going to cut out something like nuclear or wind? I mean, come on. That, that's insane. So you got to do everything as fast as you can. And we, again, we're just pokey. I mean, it's just because not enough people have died. I think um, just to also bring this home to Washington State, a lot of people believe that we have enough hydro and that we'll manage and that there won't be brownouts or blackouts. But I, the, um, the water situation is not as straightforward as one would think. And maybe you'd like to comment on that. Um, yeah, so, so if, if you look at the day-by-day -day load graphs out of Bonneville Power Administration, it shows you what's coming on the grid, what's going off the grid, all that kind of thing. Nuclear just is constant. Coal and gas, just constant, all right? Whenever wind comes up, Hydro goes down. And so hydro is used to balance the grid, all right? And that's, that's great. We have a lot of hydro. That's wonderful. But we don't have enough if you get rid of all the thermal sources. We don't have enough. Um, as, and again, you know, climate change is going to affect things. Uh, fortunately, the, color, the, uh, sorry, the Columbia River is not much affected by climate change. That is fortunate for us, all right? It's not much affected because it, it starts, its headwaters are way up in Canada. Um, and there's lots of snowpack, and there will be lots of snowpack, even, even with, with extreme climate change. But the Yakima River is going to die, and the Snake River is going to go down quite a bit. And, and you know, the, the, the Colorado, so rivers that, that depend on snowpack in, in America are going to be hurt, all right? But Columbia is not, which is nice, all right? But still, we don't have enough power if we get rid of everything else. Especially I'm, since we're talking about decommissioning the Snake River dams, which is, uh, which is amusing. I, I'm going to say uh, thank you to the internet for watching along. Uh, up to this point, we'll have the VOD immediately available on YouTube. 
uh, Twitch and, and also on my, my personal LinkedIn now. Uh, but I'm gonna, you know, um, maybe I'll cut off the recording completely and let everyone, you know, speak a little more freely. We can really hear Jim's hot takes after <laughs> oh, this. Y- you mean I've been holding back? <laughs> just a bit tell us what you think jim tell us just that was my question yeah. so so thank you very much everyone online uh i'm gonna go ahead and stop our stream right now